All right, so this is the sixth lecture in the series about creating a sustainable international civilization today. Um, this one specifically refers to the first principle in Panchasila, but in general, it refers to religious pluralism. So the fact that the first principle in Panchasila is belief in God, but it includes Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, tribal, indigenous religions, Protestant, Catholic, and Islam, simply means that in any country, what I'm going to say in this lecture and the two following about monism applies to every tradition. And it also applies to spiritual humanism because even though the Greeks had 12 Olympian deities, um, they had priority and Athena was the god of wisdom. And if you look at the tragedies and you read them in the Greek, um, they do prioritize. And um, Nous is Zeus is usually Zeus or Athena are the ultimate deities, the ones that are supposed to govern the others. And they are referred to as nous, or the word phronesis, practical wisdom is used in really critical places. And so there is this microcosm in the macrocosm ontology or view of reality underlying, I don't know, I don't know every tragedy, but it's either implicit or explicit in the in the tragedies and in the doc in the myths because uh, certain deities make mistakes and the other deities call them out and certain human beings who are possessed by a deity make mistakes and the other human beings possessed by another higher order deity call them out. Um, but, you know, the tragedians probably disagreed with each other and all that. The ones that I have studied, to my amazement, have come out with the same pattern and the same idea of phronesis, friendship as having a common mind, koinonia. It just keeps coming up, the word noose, in really significant places where there is a higher order bonding. But I don't want to go into that. I want to go into um, the transition from modern Western enlightenment thinking to what happened ever since Einstein's relativity theory and then quantum mechanics. Because starting in the 20th century with Whitehead, there have been uh, physicists, scientists who have uh, reaffirmed a, an Aristotelian notion of one underlying first principle or prime mover, force, ultimate force behind the universe, which gives it the, the kind of order which made it possible for it to exist, is what I think, but also for a creature like us to evolve why was it possible for us to evolve? Why were we so successful? Why were we so fit? Because we could understand patterns and we could understand that we understand patterns. And then we could start educating each other in the patterns that we've understood and teach each other about how to make the best choices, how to be wise. So in order to have the world that we actually have, and Aristotle did say that more than once, in order to, want to have the world where there is a creature who by nature seeks understanding, is that there is an underlying force, but it's not the God of uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. It's not an exclusive 
power at all. And even now, Hinduism is used to marginalize other traditions. And Buddhism is used, especially against Muslims. And this is really wrong. It's corrupt. It's political. It's economic. Um, but in terms of metaphysics, Aristotle's view is a resolution. It will expose all of the, the false, the actually false character of those claims and also reaffirm a connection between science and quote unquote religion or this generic view of a higher force. So it's another way to approach the integration of the world's religious traditions and humanist traditions, moving away from a specifically enlightenment, mechanistic, dualistic versus materialistic, empiricistic. Uh, those are the two views that are rejected by monism but they're also being rejected by neuroscience. And I'll have a lecture on that. They're being rejected by, um, uh, oh, just a lot of doctors, uh, trauma therapists, mental illness specialists, um, you name it. Those, pet, those paradigms of the psyche in the modern Western enlightenment tradition are the ones that separated science from religion. And those are all being rejected. And today, the new models are incorporating a certain notion of spirituality and a certain notion of a prime mover. And this is what we need to do, the common ground we need to get to, to develop an international, sustainable civilization. So, um, let me go to this lecture. Um, developments uh, in science and the idea of God in the 20th century. So I'm only going to quote from a very few people. I think it's Whitehead, Paul Davies, and then Davies quotes from Feynman. But there's more than three. Um, there's There are a number of people you could quote from. This particular lecture only has, I think, 10 slides, and that's because, uh, you know, I like to read and I might uh, find some other ones that I will include later on in the lecture, and I suppose I'll replace the lectures, but there's a lot of, lot of ways you can add to this. All right, so um, Pancasila number one is religious pluralism. I think I've said it enough times. Um, and this one is what White had said. So what happened was Einstein's relativity theory replaced the previous Newtonian mechanics. Whitehead himself was in the room in Britain at the Science Society where the research, the data came in from South Africa, because the scientists had gone to South Africa to see an eclipse to either confirm or refute Einstein's claim that space is curved. And so Whitehead was in the room when it was confirmed. And um, Newton, uh, Einstein's relativity was replaced, uh, replaced Newton. Now, the other thing that's important is that Einstein did not want to call his theory relativity. And that it refers to that time and space are relative to motion. He wanted to call it the theory of invariance, <laughs> the things that don't change. Well, Aristotle thought time and space are relative to motion. <laughs> Go figure. And Aristotle thought there was something that was invariant. So we just constantly have this, people who are trained to have rejected Aristotle don't even consider it. And um, Einstein 
himself was very aware of the value of the spiritual leaders in the past, what they have to offer in terms of insights about how to live and how to relate to each other. So he thought the imagination was more important than knowledge. You had to reimagine the universe. Anyway, so he's much, he's a holistic thinker. And again, when quantum mechanics replaced Einstein, it Einstein freaked out and he said, God doesn't play dice. But then the quantum theorist said, no, no, that's not what quantum mechanics implies. It doesn't imply that God plays dice. So in the next lecture, um, Heinrich Pasch wrote a book, The One, and he says quantum mechanics, the best hypothesis to explain where they're at now, this book was written 2023, I think, or published, is that there is is monism. There is an underlying unifying force. So once again, <laughs> there's this, I think scientists get trained a certain way. They get rewarded for being trained that way. And then if something comes along that's different, they feel threatened. They're too set in their ways to really understand that actually this new thing, it's not an either or, it's an expanded view of the basic principles and the basic force underneath. The very fact that human beings are capable of taking the knowledge they've acquired and uh, creating a new hypothesis, a new way of looking at the data and the new theory is accepted if it accounts for more of reality. That whole process is Aristotelian because it all implies that there actually is a reality out there and it's ordered in a certain way. And the best explanation is the one that accounts for the most data and in the simplest possible um, in the, in the simplest way. So if there's a simple formula, E equals MC squared, and it accounts for more of what's out there, that would be the thesis chosen. Well, that's what Aristotle would have done. He would have chosen Einstein based on his principle. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, uh, to be is to be ordered and to be as simple and intelligible as possible. So Einstein's view was more comprehensive, more simple, more intelligible. And um, so it would win. Plus that time and space are relative to motion. That's Aristotle also. <laughs> How many you know trained scientists are aware of that? I don't know. I try not to worry about it, but um, uh, Whitehead said, you know, Aristotle found it necessary to complete his metaphysics by the introduction of a prime mover. This is an important fact in the history of metaphysics because if we are to account to anyone the position of the great metaphysician, having regard to the genius of his insight, um, to general equipment in knowledge and to the stimulus of his metaphysical ancestry, we have to choose Aristotle. Aristotle is the greatest metaphysician. Secondly, in his consideration of his metaphysical question, he was entirely dispassionate. He was not trying to defend or, or destroy any sort of religious tradition. And he's the last European of first-rate importance for whom the claim can be made. After Aristotle, um, ethical and religious interests began to influence metaphysical conclusions. So that's important. He didn't have a bias. It was a free scientific inquiry, free intellectual inquiry. On the subject of his prime mover, he would have no motive except to follow his metaphysical train of thought. It didn't lead him very far toward the production of a God available for religious purposes. 
Aristotle's God does not intervene in human affairs. He doesn't talk to people. He doesn't favor one group of people over another. He doesn't work, have a special uh, plan for human history or anything about that, that people use to uh, justify uh, their superiority, even doing harm to other traditions, it may be doubted whether any properly general metaphysician can ever, without the illicit introduction of other considerations, get much further than Aristotle. For nothing within a limited type of experience can give intelligence to shape our ideas of an entity at the base of all actual things, unless the general character of things requires there is such an entity. And so Whitehead himself um, needed that sort of entity, and he called it the principle of concretion. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I really don't know all about Whitehead's special language. Um, I had a colleague who told me I read Plato the way Whitehead read Plato, and um, I read Plato and Aristotle is very compatible. So I think, um, you know, Whitehead and I could have some good conversations. But when I decided, I told him maybe I should learn Whitehead, he sent me a 140 page vocabulary. And I just thought, no, it's like speaking another language. And I don't, I don't have the time or energy to do that. I just don't understand why you have to create a whole new language, but somehow Whitehead thought so. I'll leave that to him. Um, but Whitehead's process philosophy, I would call Aristotle's activity energia. And I'll just let that go. I'll just say that Whitehead did affirm some idea of Aristotle's prime mover. He recognizes you have to have that in order to have a coherent metaphysics. Also, he, th he thought that Einstein's view required a different view of religion. Religion won't regain its power until it can face change in the same spirit as science does. Its principles may be eternal, but the expression has to be continually developed. Religion is the expression of one type of fundamental experiences of hum humankind. It's the vision of something which stands beyond, behind, and within the passing flux of immediate things, something which is real and yet waiting to be realized, something that is a remote possibility and yet the greatest of present facts, something that gives meaning to all that passes and eludes apprehension, something whose possession is the final good, and yet is beyond all reach, something which is the ultimate ideal in the hopeless quest. So the way I, I just see it as everything by nature heads toward higher and higher levels of being, complexity, and that is what good is. To good and being in our minds can hardly be separated. I don't think they can be separated. To be is to be good. And um, this force is constantly inspiring higher and higher levels of being. Um, I And then I also think that studying the Greek deities and all the others, um, tragedies, stories, comedies, all of that is good because what I argue is there is that same idea of human flourishing within a universe that also is constantly seeking higher and higher levels of flourishing, that this microcosm, the macrocosm, is that ideal, which it's not hope. I don't like the expression a hopeless quest. It's that I my everybody's responsibility is to flourish to the highest level they're capable of. If they do pass on 
a better world to their children. Their children are capable of even higher levels. So this quest is what gives human beings hope. It's what gives the next generation hope that they will get passed down to them um, a flourishing society that they can pick up on. And so hopeless to me is if you get cynical and you think it's all about money, it's all about power, I'm going to grab what I can before it's all over. That takes away hope from people, cynicism. And it makes them frightened and all sorts of stuff. So living for the sake of flourishing is what hope is. You wake up in the morning, you hope you can make good judgments that day. And then as you do it, you become the hope. You are the hope. Hope exists because people are capable of improving uh, their minds and making better judgments and developing wisdom and becoming more of a microcosm in the macrocosm and making their cultures closer to the integration of nature and culture. Um, gradually, slowly, steadily, the vision of the good, I would say, recurs in history under nobler form and with clearer expression. It's, it's the one element in human experience which persistently shows an upward trend. It fades and then recurs. But when it renews its force, it recurs with an added richness and purity of content. The fact of the religious vision and its history of persistent expansion is our one ground for optimism. Okay, so this particular quote is uh, relevant because my mission in these lectures, but in life in general, is this vision that I have, right? This idea of synthesizing um, religious pluralism, Greek humanism, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, Aristotle's notion of political life, um, political, yeah, the polis, and then sustainability, integrating culture and nature. So my synthesis of that is a vision that's, I don't, I can't, I don't flatter myself that it's something new because I basically thought this way 57 years ago. And I think a lot of people did. It's just that this is not the direction the culture has gone. It's just that we have to develop that kind of vision or we're going to self-destruct. We, You know, to continue on the fossil fuel, but to also think that, that just Bill Gates and his venture, you know, into green energy is going to work is it won't. It won't if religious leaders don't convince the public and people don't realize that if they love God, if they're faithful to their religious tradition, they need to go green. Because Bill Gates might have the whole thing figured out scientifically or as an engineer, and people will just reject it. So the cultural side, the idea of the good, the idea of justice and virtue and practical wisdom, that's what where Aristotle has both of those. He has the view of reality. He has the view that science needs to be linked to the moral virtues and this underlying uh, force of order so that a flourishing culture is necessarily integrated with nature. So that's what I bring to the conversation that's my vision of the good. And I just want to work with a lot of other people. Um, St. Paul said, now we see in a mirror dimly, then we shall see face to face. Or there's the story of the six blind men and the elephant. Each one touches a different part of the elephant and they all disagree, but actually it's the same elephant. So. Um, it's really important that I articulate my vision 
and then hopefully Indonesians or people from other countries would contact me and they can articulate their vision. I would like to, in the rest of my life, work collaboratively with other people to keep expanding this vision. And what I have to offer is what Greek culture, as I understand it, has to offer because it's so multidimensional. Um, all right. This vision claims nothing but worship. Well, um, you know, that that wouldn't be the way I would describe Aristotle. I would say it requires um, wisdom, <laughs> uh, humility, arrogance. It's the opposite of arrogance. It requires self-knowledge. It requires knowing what you know and what you don't know. It requires knowing what you have control over and what you don't have control over. But anyway, so um, so Whitehead says, worship is surrender to the claim for a simulation, urged with the motive force of mutual love. The vision never overrules. It's always there. It has the power of love presenting the one purpose whose fulfillment is eternal harmony. Such order as we find in nature is never force. It presents itself as the one harmonious adjustment of complex detail. So, you know, for a Muslim, one of their principles is surrender, right? When they pray, they surrender. And also gratitude, infidel means ungrateful. So that would be probably the road that a Muslim would come into to having this um, respect for the universe and understanding our place within it. I know that Aristotle, he's always talking about nature. Nature does nothing in vain. And he also, he actually wrote, you know, his political and metaphysical stuff. What he was really interested in was dissecting plants and animals he was a biologist and he was an environmental biologist because he always looked at a certain plant and tried to find out the species and then how that species relates to the other species. So he was always into um, a biosphere and every um, organ in an animal's body, he would it had a function or a purpose. So you always ask why. What was it that the organism needed to develop in order to survive or be fit? So survival means just flourish, to achieve its perfect form, which for most animals is just to survive. There isn't that much different. There's some difference. In humans, it's fundamental. It's a huge difference. Um, although, we, I mean, we've flattered ourselves into thinking we're surviving when we're really slowly committing suicide, but that's a whole nother issue. Um, it's just that he says um, that he's been criticized by other, I suppose, intellectuals because he gets his hands all dirty and all he cares about are these plants and animals. And he said, no, they are a species of the beautiful. He says, if you look at all the parts and how they fit into this whole and how uh, marvelous it is, it's a, it's beautiful. So um, that would be the kind of just basic appreciation of this force. You know, there's the ultimate prime mover, but then there's all the ways that um, nature uh, is following that. It's the principle of higher and higher levels of complexity. So there's sort of an analogy and the universe is constantly expanding. And, and of course, Aristotle, again, didn't think that, but he would definitely agree with it. He would say that fits with my principle even better than fixed species or than fixed um, stars, heavenly bodies, because that means that it's just this constant force toward greater and greater um, forms, higher and higher complexity. So of course he would he would go wow that's even better than I thought instead of people using the fact that he thought you know the heavenly bodies were 
eternally in the same spheres. And then, okay, Aristotle is anti-science. If you just look at his principles, his basic foundation, <laughs> it's just so unfair. And then this fixed species part is Linnaeus was the guy for the fixed species. And he and Darwin were the ones that were in conflict. But because the Catholic Church had co-opted Aristotle, Linnaeus associated Aristotle with fixed species. And that's really not the way Aristotle thought. Um, so there, yeah, well, anyway, there's been all this misunderstanding. And now systems thinking like Capra and Luis, Luisi Luigi, um, they're saying, gee, a lot of what Aristotle thought, the basic principles, ah, they're true. Yeah, there's just a whole history of why it got um misunderstood, thrown out, whatever. It was not, it was a mistake. And we live with that mistake. Because I think if we'd stuck to Aristotle, we would call out our own destruction of the natural world and we would at least be calling each other out for corruption. We wouldn't be calling it God's will, but that's what we did. <laughs> All right. White... Whitehead wanted nature to be recognized as an organic system, which is what Aristotle thought, and human beings as passionate and creative, not primarily rational or emotionally detached. Okay, and so what he's referring to is um, Kant's dualistic notion of rational, which was emotionally detached. And um, so he's a culture that focuses on organisms. This is a quote from Whitehead, including ourselves as organism will require the arts as necessary for us to understand emotions. This is coming back the neuro scientists. We have neuro arts. And I do have some quotes from a recent book called Your Brain on Art, where they study that human beings absolutely need art in order to function as flourishing human beings. Okay, quote, in the most advanced industrial countries, art was treated as, a, as frivolous. Um, and that's true, Kant and Hume. Hume thought art would just promote empathy. Kant really thought it was just leisure time activity just looking at nice designs on wallpaper. It was not, it was not taken seriously as a kind of emotional education, a kind of training to go from what's sensual to what's spiritual. So the ancient wisdom traditions took the arts very seriously. And that's where artists were, um, but not in the modern world. It radically changed. And I remember reading that. I took a philosophy art course as an undergrad, and that was what got me into philosophy. This is really important that art has been trivialized, which means our emotions are not getting trained. Our senses are not getting trained. And if we, if we have constant chaos coming in, we're not going to be able to think clearly. Um, the two evils of modernity are ignoring, ignoring, and he has, I don't know why he says the ignoration. I I don't know why he has all this crazy language, but okay. Ignorance of the true relation of each organism to its environment. Definitely, that's very important. The habit of ignoring the intrinsic worth of the environment, which must be allowed its weight in any consideration of final ends. Excellent, like that's exactly right. And so that's what I'm on board with. Any idea of the good someone has for their life or their society needs to include the intrinsic worth of the environment. So Whitehead knew this way back at the beginning of the 20th century, hundred over a hundred years ago. Physical wandering is still important to develop but greater still is the power of man's spiritual oh, adventures, adventures of thought, adventures of passionate feeling, adventures of aesthetic experience. So physical wandering, I suppose, but wondering, right? 
physical inquiry into the physical aspects of the natural world is important, but uh, speculation, passionate feeling, aesthetic experience, those are also really important. So the sciences and the arts are both important, which means liberal education in the arts and sciences together is important. God and the new physics. So this is Paul Davies. He's a quantum physicist. And this is from the second half of the 20th century. He wrote a number of books. He wrote um, The Cosmic Blueprint, The Mind of God. He writes about the soul. And the mind is a holistic concept. Soul is a holistic concept. I, I really appreciate this. I recommend it. Um, but there are many other uh, quantum physicists, environmental biologists, just a lot of people in the sciences that would agree with this basic premise. The seemingly miraculous concurrency of numerical values that nature has assigned to her fundamental constants must remain the most compelling evidence for an element of cosmic design. So... The very fact that when we create mathematical models to, to understand the universe, they work. <laughs> well, they work because the universe is actually ordered. It's ordered because there is an ultimate ordering principle. The brain is the medium of expression of the human mind. Similarly, the entire physical universe would be the medium of expression of the mind of a natural God. In this context, God is the supreme holistic concept, perhaps many levels of description above that of the human mind. So just like there is an ultimate ordering principle that explains the material universe as we understand it and learn about it, just like there is an ultimate idea of the good in any person's mind that explains their behavior, or when you say, I can't figure out why they did that, it's because they lost their mind. They lost their idea of the good. They got angry or they changed from their idea of the good as to love your neighbor as yourself to taking revenge on somebody. But they changed their mind before they could possibly actually choose this vengeful act. Um so, for example, when 9-11 hit, before 9-11, Americans thought about one set of things. And then all of a sudden afterwards, they were very gullible for changing their minds because they hadn't really thought enough about, about a possible terrorist attack. I had thought about it. It wouldn't surprise me at all, considering how we treated people in the Mideast and they had money and they were going to get back at us. Um, but anyway, the idea of the good, it's important that you understand the things that you do are driven by some idea of the good. And it's either a much more long-term view, a much more uh, contextual uh, cosmic view that you can stick to in the face of all the particulars, or it's not a very strong view when you're much more gullible to changes in your immediate situation. But there's always a mind behind what you do. There's always why. You're always, you always have to have a reason. Or you can say, you can regret something. I thought I did that without thinking, but then you think about the fact that you did it without thinking and then you have to self-correct. Um, I began by making the claim that science offers a surer path than religion in the search for God. Um, it is my deep conviction that only by understanding the world in all its many aspects, both reductionistic and holistic, mathematical and poetical, through forces, fields, and particles, as well as through good and evil, that we will come to understand ourselves and the meaning behind this universe, our home. Oh, so... At least you can say one aspect of the meaning 
is that we integrate nature and culture. I don't think anybody who unites reason and faith or uses their mind or is humanistic is not going to believe that the meaning of our life is to destroy life on earth because the second coming or because eschatology, somehow God ordained that life on earth would only last so long and God would give us the tools to ultimately destroy it and that's okay as long as we believe in God. That, I think that is really sick. <laughs> you made yourself into God, you put God on a timeline, you decide for God what the point of life on earth is, or um, you think life is meaningless. You're a secular humanist, there isn't any meaning, everything is absurd. That I find extremely offensive because you're going to look at your child's face. You're going to look your child in the face or some other child and say, I know life is meaningless. I know I can be free to do whatever I like. I know I don't have to worry about what kind of world I'm passing on to you. So, hey, good luck. It's I do not understand why it isn't absolutely intuitively obvious that the meaning of life, whatever else it is, is to look at young children, whether they're yours or not, and think, I've got to do whatever I can do so that they can have a life that either involves as much flourishing as my parents and their gen before the generation before that gave to me, or even more, but at least as much for my generation to give to the next generation a worse world than we inherited is, is evil. Like it's unacceptable. In the name of life being meaningless, this is, you know, one evil on top of the other. But it's really, to me, a flawed idea of the good. But it is an idea. People have these ideas that justify what I would call intuitively obvious um, evil. What is more important than passing on a flourishing society to the next generation? And that's something you can actually know. And all these other speculations are hubris. You're claiming to know something you don't know. You're overstepping your bounds. You're being arrogant. You're being ungrateful. Yeah. The Greek view of hubris, um, overstepping the bounds, going to an extreme, that's, that's kind of obvious. We can get that through evolution, and we can get that through reading any sort of sacred texts. Okay, Richard Feynman is another well-known quantum physicist. All the sciences, not just the sciences, but all the efforts of intellectual kinds are an endeavor to see the connections of the hierarchy, right? To understand, to connect beauty to history, to connect history to man's psychology, man's psychology to the working of the brain, the brain to the neural impulse, the neural impulse to the chemistry, and so forth, up and down both ways. Today we cannot, and it's no use making believe that we can, draw carefully a line all the way from one end of this thing to the other, because we've only just begun to see that there's this relative hierarchy. And I don't think either end is nearer to God. So this, uh, so this is, again, this is the way I think. And these series of lectures is going to include a whole lot of, um, different disciplines, different ways of looking at things, and they all end up with sort of the same goal. I think 42 lectures, I don't, I didn't include, you know, like the Greeks view of beauty or history, but they have it. I mean, I've written about it elsewhere. Um, and they're all interconnected. It's great. Uh, I love it. And I'm glad Mr. Feynman said that because he is a extremely highly respected quantum physicist. The main, okay. And so um, the book actually in the next lecture, 
there's a quantum physicist who says the main message of this book is that monism, the belief in one ultimate force, is fruitful for science. It follows straightforwardly from quantum mechanics taken seriously. It provides a philosophical framework for the most recent work in quantum gravity and a new perspective needed to approach the fundamental problems in particle physics and cosmology. There exists solid evidence that monism is at least a promising hypothesis, and he regards monism as the best motivated and most promising candidate for a principle defining the foundations of physics we have. So this is just jumping ahead to the next lecture, but I, I wanted to point out this is where it's going. So this one is about the 20th century, but we're heading into the 21st century. And nothing that has been discovered in the 21st century has necessarily refuted this switch and this um, hypothesis of monism. So that gets us back to linking um, all of these trends together, which is what these lectures are about, or what my YouTube channel is about also. Um, so if there are things in these lectures that uh, you were looking for that you don't find, because I have them named, they're on a YouTube channel where I have other playlists and the name of the channel is The Legacy of Ancient Greek Civilization in the Era of Globalization. So before I started this playlist, I think there were about 80 um, videos. They're about an hour each. And um, they, you have playlists so you can get an idea of which thing you would like to approach. But just the idea that everything is connected to everything. That's what Plato thought. A dialectician sees the whole and the parts in relationship to the whole. Aristotle also saw the four causes involved at every level of being. And then the ultimate final cause is the, the universe. And that's the first principle. Okay.